Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we have a response video today. I'm here with Deflating Atheism. Hey, hey. And uh, today we're going to respond to a Huffington Post article by uh, Victor Stinger. So, uh, overall, I think he strawmans a lot of the arguments and misses the point and so on of most of the arguments. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he quotes the Bill Nye versus Ham debate i think he tries to set up a hasty generalization of what most theist and atheist arguments are like in the beginning here yeah but, uh, well, ken uh, ham is or is the atheist's uh, favorite christian so besides the westboro baptist church people yeah 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 um even though overall if you combine both ken ham and westboro baptist church that's like 35 people <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. A big hasty generalization of like 2.5 billion people, but uh, yeah. Also, uh, I want to say first off, uh, we should note that Victor Stenger uh, uh, died probably not long after this article was published. But uh, he is he is a he was a public atheist who's held in some esteem by his fellow atheists. And uh, uh, JMD Apologetics here gave me the article, and I tried to jump into these things as un as unprepared as possible, but I just scanned through it like an hour ago, and I was just astounded by how dumb the article was. I I, I mean, it really it really makes you see just how how completely vacuous uh, the new atheism movement is, because this is this is really low level Reddit stuff here. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh typically what you get from a HuffPo article, at least from the articles I've read concerning religion and so on. Yeah. And it's very strange that it was published in Huffington Post because this is not this isn't even really necessarily aimed at, at atheists who are debating on the internet. It's meant for people who are on stage in a formal debate standing in front of lecterns, you know. Yeah. So it's a very strange thing to publish in Huffington Post. Yeah. Um, he also quotes here that most debates involve an atheist scientist, philosopher, or formal clergy person. But then, you know, he, he claims that the only people that they typically debate are Christian theologians or, you know, other clergy persons. But he sort of leaves, leave out Christian philosophers like William Lane Craig and so on. Yeah. So there's a suppressed evidence there, that fallacy, I believe. And then, of course, another hasty general, generalization. Yeah. So he he also um claims that religious people are only good um are only good at these debates because they teach and so on in classes and so on they actually their arguments are actually good but you know they just have experience with public speaking and so on. I I, I thought that was funny. He says uh, uh they learn in front of religion classes like all their lives they're they're just they're just training all their lives to be in debate with atheists, so that's why that's why uh, the Christians smoke the atheists in the debates. I thought that was pretty funny myself. Well, I, I found it more to be saying, you know, they, they only have this experience of public speaking and so on, so they can convince people in a debate to sound more convincing, but their arguments themselves are not convincing. Yeah, here, here's the direct quote. Uh, okay. uh, uh, the Christians are almost always very smooth and well prepared. The reason is not that their arguments are so persuasive, but that they generally have spent years in front of religion classes, lecture audiences, and church congregants, church congregants polishing the same old arguments. So yeah, we're, we're just all we're just all uh, uh, practicing for for getting in front of atheists and from formal debates. Apparently, yeah. Um. I think it's the complete opposite. I think, uh, you know, atheist people online just read Reddit all the time and so on. But yes, exactly, exactly. So they could say that argument's been debunked. Yeah, yeah. Where are your sources? Uh, Reddit dot com. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, that doesn't make much sense. So let me uh, see here. If there's anything else on here. Yes, and he, go, he goes into a quote by Dan Barker here. Dan Barker is seriously a dimwit, but uh, 
And I, I don't have a high opinion of public atheists in general, but Dan Barker is just about the bottom of the barrel. I think the probably one of the best debaters I've seen on the atheist side that can apply with um good debater, not so much good arguments, is Christopher Hitchens. I think he's a, a good debater, but when he actually get pressed, when he gets pressed on certain claims that he makes, I just find that he can just sway himself out of it without actually answering questions and so on. Well, he he he's a very he was a very persuasive speaker. Yeah, so yeah. I, I mean, I mean, he he definitely had rhetoric on his side as far as actually marshalling an argument. No, that was not a, a strength of him. Yeah. Um. Oh, a guy in the comment section just uh said that he's contributing a chapter to a forthcoming book responding to Barker. So that I'll have to keep track of that. So that's cool. Um, so the par the paragraph right before he gets into some of the arguments is uh, I will mainly emphasize scientific arguments that is those based on empirical evidence and lack thereof. And I think he's making the claim that he's going to debunk mostly scientific arguments. If that is the claim, then obviously he presents his very first argument that he debunks apparently is the ontological argument. Yeah. Which, uh, I think he sort of strawmans the argument, but I'm, I'm probably thinking of Planigus and Dr. Craig's version of it. I haven't really read St. Amsel's. Uh, yeah. But basically, the grace being that can be conceived. No being other than that can be conceived. So. Yeah, no, 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 the greatest possible being. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I could just read what he says here. Okay. Okay, so so what he does is that he, he presents uh, the uh, kind of christian his own kind of christian straw man and then he responds to it and so here's here's him speaking as, as the christian god can be proved to exist by logic alone for example we have the ontological argument which appears in many forms it was first proposed by saint anselm in the 11th century he defines god as a being than which no greater can be conceived if such a being only exists in the mind then we could conceive of, of a greater being but we cannot imagine a a greater being than God, so God must exist in reality. And and uh, Stenger responds, "You are right. This argument has been proposed in many forms over the centuries. All have logical flaws. As for the original Anselm argument, it can be used to prove the existence of many non-existent things, such as the perfect pizza." Okay, he's misrepresenting the ontological argument here. It, it, it states that there the, a being uh, uh, for which no greater being can be conceived. So, like, a, a, a perfect pizza would not be omnipotent. It would not be om, omnibenevolent, you know. It would not, it could not console grieving widows or whatnot. So you could, you could, you know, play with the definition of pizza uh, until, until it meets all those requirements. But then what you'd end up with is a pizza has, that has none of the attributes of being a pizza, but all of the attributes of being God. So that's not well, really it's, oh it's not right, a good response sorry, to the uh, ontological argument. Yeah. It also talks about a being. A pizza is a thing, not a being. So well, well, I I mean it's it's a material thing, and so I mean it's yeah. bounded yeah. in space and time and yeah. Now I personally now I, it's probably just me, but I don't get the logic of a lot of ontological arguments. Because I well, I you you could probably explain it better to me because I've I've tried studying them and they're just very confusing. I, I I typically refrain from using the the ontological argument myself because I I think to uh, it's a bit much for for most atheists to swallow. But I, I most most of the objections to the ontological argument are very bad and very stupid. So rather than uh, putting forth the ontological argument myself. I, I just really uh, defend it against dumb objections, and, and atheists certainly have plenty of those. Yeah, uh, obviously, if you know someone comes up to me and get and asks me, "Hey, do you have good reasons to believe in God?" I probably won't start out with the ontological argument. No, I, I, I don't recommend that any Christian uh, uh, do so, and 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 popular guys like 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 William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig uh, uh, defends the ontological argument. That's just not his first line of defense. Yeah, 
That's like um, if all his arguments somehow get demolished, which they have not been yet, and will not be. I, I think um, that that argument I I still think is uh, valid and sound yeah. and so on. It, it, it's it's funny uh, uh, if you go to the Wikipedia the Wikipedia page for the ontological argument, they actually have a computer program that that uh, uh, analyzes the validity of arguments called Prover Six. And it, it actually analyzed the, the Anselm's original formulation of the ontological argument, and they said it, it, it's sound and valid, so it all checks out. So apparently by a computer program says that it's a valid argument. Yeah, I in my logic class, you know, you had to draw out all the symbols to prove the validity. Uh, I find that totally unnecessary. I think, generally speaking, you can tell if it's valid or not if you assume the premises to be true. Yeah. But soundness is really the biggest question. But of oh, course. Oh, wait, go ahead. Which brings me uh, uh, to a certain uh, uh, point here. Okay. Uh, Stenger continues, but there is a basic point to be made here. Ontological arguments are defined as those made from logic alone with no reference to, to observation. But no logical deduction can tell you anything that is not already embedded in its premises. Okay, that's actually incorrect. But uh, if that were the case, uh, all, all all logical arguments would just be begging the question, which is not the case. So Stenger's is wrong there. Well, all logic, uh, all logic does. I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Okay. Well, again, this is Stenger. All logic does is draw the conclusions that follow from those premises and check for any inconsistencies. Only by observation can we demonstrate whether the premises ac accurately describe or reflect the real world. That's an argument right there, so he needs logic. Yeah. But what's interesting here is that the, the ontological argument, or at least, the, at least Anselm's formulation, only has one premise. And that premise is that is that a, a, such a being can exist. So so uh, when when philosophers debate, uh, 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 you know, the ontological argument, that's the, that's the premise they go after because they they know it's a valid argument. They they just not you know when atheists attack it, they try to attack the soundness of it. But uh, since since Stenger here is is is, ref, is kind of rejecting the premise of of the ontological argument he's rejecting the premise that uh that the greatest possible being can exist his only other option is that the greatest possible being cannot exist so he he's backing himself into strong atheism yeah and it seems like to me let, let's uh take alvin planga's version of the ontological argument i think it goes something like this um if if it's even possible for God to exist and therefore He does exist, yeah. If that is valid and sound, then you can't adopt a lack of belief. You have to obviously refute the argument by showing that God cannot exist at all. Yes, and, and that that goes to what I was going to say is that uh, uh, Stanger here is not in any position where he can hide behind uh, a, a, a kind of professed lack of belief. He, his only option here would be would be strong atheism. Well, like I pointed out uh, before we started the thing um, of how he's – let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, certainly atheist debaters will make their own arguments for atheism unless they're making the case that atheism is just a lack of belief, of course, during our opening statements. To me, that sounds like a proposition that God does not exist. Yeah. So keep that in mind because he equivocates atheism quite a bit in this article. Actually, I just I just thought of something. Uh, that was actually the name of his book, "How Science Shows God Does Not Exist." He, so he definitely was a strong atheist. I'll, I'll respect that. That's valid. I, I think that's more coherent, sort yeah. of. But it's not sound, of course. So, at least, um, at least it's owning your own uh, argument, unlike unlike the yeah. lack of belief atheist who who seem to change what it is they believe uh, whenever it's convenient. Yeah. Um. So we should probably uh, go on to the next thing here. Science and religion are compatible as evidence by the fact that many scientists are believers. And um, he points out the National Academy of Science, 
of science is that only 7% of members believe in God. A personal God. This and, is uh, what's so hilarious to me is that is that atheists make these towering proclamations that science and religion are incompatible, you know, which is a very strong statement. But when, when you hold their feet to the fire, uh, their entire they're just basically hanging their hats on this 20 year old informal survey of the national Academy of sciences members that no one seems to be able to locate a, a hard copy of this informal survey. But that is, that is their entire argument is that 20 years ago, they took a survey of NAS members and, and only 7% were theists. Therefore science and religion are incompatible. And, and well, I that hilarious. Yeah, that's an ad populum too. Just because scientists believe that science and faith are incompatible, they obviously are not in the field of theology, so they're going to yeah. fail in their theology. It seems like too. But I, I mean, I think I think uh, uh, empirically uh, uh, it's oh, erroneous yeah. as well because if you look at the research of Elaine Howard Eklund, I mean, she found it. It varies from country to country in America. Thir about 30% of scientists are religion. It, it, it varies according to the discipline. Uh, internationally, I think in a lot of countries, 50% of, of scientists are religious. And, and in some, in some uh, countries like Hong Kong and, and Taiwan, uh, scientists are actually more religious than, than the general population. Yeah, now, of course, they're going to make the argument, oh, but religion can't agree on what type of God or what God is and so on. Well, uh, well, <laughs> it's not on us to defend that. It's just if they're making yeah. the argument that science and religion are incompatible, I mean, the burden of proof is on them to prove it. And yeah. and I I don't like, I personally do not like making the argument that science and religion are compatible because I'm not exactly sure what it means for them to be incompatible. Now, if science and religion being incompatible means that a person cannot both be a, a scientist and be a religious, well, then pointing out the, the numbers of, of, of scientists who are, religion, who are religious would be a perfectly valid way of, of, of refuting that. And it doesn't yeah. matter, it doesn't matter if, if only 30% if or 70% are, as long as there's one scientist out there who is religious, that would refute the premise that, that a, a scientist cannot be religious. And if that's not what uh, the supposed incompatible incompatibility of science and religion is, I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, and plus, uh, as Frank Turk would say, science says nothing, but scientists do. So yeah, well, let's let's I'm going to uh, uh, read what what Stenger says here. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. So so he throws out uh, some assertions here. He throws out some whoppers here. Believing scientists compartmentalize their brains, leaving their critical thinking skills at the lab when they go to church, and leaving their Bibles at home when they go to the lab. God is not a coherent part of the scientific model of any believing scientist. Okay, uh, uh, ref citation, please. What, what is your basis for these proclamations? Yeah, did he empirically prove that, by the way, scientifically, or is he making... Assumption, but you know. yeah, what what a what a what a just baseless accusation. Believing scientists compartmentalize their brains, leaving their critical thinking skills at the lab when they go to church. Hey, uh, Victor Stenger, just because you're not capable of thinking critically about religion does not mean that all scientists are okay. And, and leaving their Bibles at home, you don't know they might bring their Bible to the lab. You don't know that. You can't say that. But yes, it is true uh, uh, in, in a trivial sense. The scientist, when, when the scientist, qua scientist, does kind of compartmentalize uh, uh, his activities. When he's performing uh, uh, his experiments, uh, he may not be thinking about God. He's also, he also doesn't let the fact that you know, he has to pick up his kid from soccer practice or whatever, he do doesn't let that interfere with his, with his practice of science either. I mean, so what? Yeah, basically. And uh, it, even if this were true, it would not disprove religion in any sense because he doesn't try and refute you know, religion, religious claims. I think he says um, science relies on observation while uh, religion re 
relies on revelation, but you yeah, receive well, revelation yeah, through observation. Science, but yeah, science and religion are fundamentally incompatible because of their contradictory views on the source of knowledge. Science assumes that only by observation can we learn about the world. What a what a load of horseshit! What a load of horseshit! <laughs> okay. I I I really I really start to think that si that atheists don't even really understand what science is. They seem to think that science is scientism. No, science does not assume any such thing. And scientists it, it, do. Yeah. Yeah. Religion assumes that in addition we learn by revelations from God. Well, that's a, that's a pretty broad claim about all religion, but yeah, that's true in the case of Christianity at least. Um, but, I would even disagree with that point because, in general, revelation, what is revealed is through observation of the creation. You know, the heavens declare the declare yeah. the glory of God, and so on. So, good point. Good point. Yeah, a, a, a special revelation would come from the Bible. So, what we observe in biblical claims are these actually true and whatnot? Did Jesus yeah. actually rise from the dead? So, it's still observation. But, but yes, uh, uh, the scientific method nowhere recommends that the scientific method is somehow the, the source of all, all knowledge. That yeah. is an extra scientific claim. That is a metaphysical claim. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, now now when you deal in metaphysics, you're going to be on science and the physical world. That's yeah. the point of metaphysics. So we should... Uh, it's, it's an epistemological what? claim, but yeah, it's not a scientific claim. Yeah. Um, the next one is, you know, he attacks say uh, Augustine and Aquinas and so on. Yeah, they 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 tried to apply science to learn about God's creation, but they ruled revelation over observation. We already went over that. I'm more I'm more interested in this final paragraph because the 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 next thing is um you know the claim that scientists science was started by Christians and whatnot. Um, yeah. He, he trots out the the the, the fraudulent uh, uh, pseudo history of atheists, whereby uh, Christianity uh, uh, ceased all scientific discovery in the Dark Ages, and it's only yeah. it's only in the Renaissance when 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 we cast off the shackles of religion that that science started up again, which is um, a lie. But yes, well, e but, even then, the Renaissance wasn't really run by a. Atheists and so on. I think no, and, and, and Galile Galileo was a devout Christian himself. Yeah. So, well, so uh, you know, framing it as as religion versus science uh, uh, is is a very dishonest way of framing it. And also, uh, uh, Galileo's censure uh, had a lot to do with with various claims he made about the then Pope. So, uh, and very little to do with his, with his, with his cosmology. So, okay. Well, would that be your response where he says, of course, Galileo and Newton were Christians. Their only other choice was to be burned at the stake. Well, if they were oh going to Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, atheist, please give me the name of any atheist throughout history who was burned at the stake by Christians for the crime of being an atheist. Give me their name. One. Because I can give, there have been hundreds of thousands of Christians who have been executed by atheists for the crime of being Christians. Give me the name of one atheist who is executed by Christians for the crime of being an atheist. Just one. What a load of shit. Yeah. I'm sure they could, you know, find one one case of, you know, the billions of people who have lived on the planet. Yeah. But we can give millions of cases, but that's yeah. the point. So uh, let's move on to his response to the te teleological argument. The obvious presence of design and complexity in the world, especially in light, proves there was a designer. And basically, he goes into evolution. Now, I'm an old Earth creationist, but yeah, I don't believe in macro evolution. I'm sure you obviously get that distinction. Mm. Now, I, I could believe in common descent, but ultimately, you have to have design for the origin of life in the cell itself. Yeah. And uh, Michael B. He makes a pretty good case for that in uh, Darwin's Black Box. So that that that's just a quick response to that. Oh yeah. Well, well that, let me let me just read his last paragraph here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just... In physics as well as biology, simplicity begets complexity. A beautiful snowflake comes from un unstructured water vapor. 
Okay, well, actually, that sounds good enough to me as a theist. I mean, I, I believe in a divinely simple God that begets creation. So that's, I don't have yeah. a problem with that. But then his next sentence is, the notion that intelligent design is necessary for the complexity of the universe is completely wrong. Now, that's a complete non sequitur. That does not yeah. follow from the previous sentence in, in any sense. And uh, I, I think there's also some some more suppressed evidence because he actually doesn't attack the modern-day teleological argument, which is the fine-tuning argument. He just uh, attacks yeah. the watchmaker argument, which, of course, I agree is not the best teleological argument. But Yeah. Based no, on definitely the, the fine-tuning of, of the constants of the universe is, is just astounding. And I, I don't believe he even touches on it in this article. I think he does a little later, so okay. we'll eventually get to that. Um, many Christians believe in evolution. Yes, that's true, but he equivocates evolution with neo-Darwinism and theistic evolution. So he presupposes neo-Darwinian evolution and so on in this. Mm. He still says it's intelligent design, which is not necessarily true. But. Okay. And he throws out another whopper here. He says, there is no room for God in evolution. Uh, why? Why do you say that? Again, well, he's, he's, he seems to be confusing scientific claims with, with extra scientific claims here. Yeah. And uh, he, he goes into the next thing is very relevant. Science has, still has not shown how life begins. He admits that it's true while many online atheists uh, apparently claim that abiogenesis have been, has been proven, even though we know that not to be true. Um, and then he points out the 1953 uh, Miller experiment, where he suppresses evidence again and doesn't state uh, that our you know early atmosphere did not have the same uh, mo uh, crap, elements in the air and so on. Mm. And uh. He also, amino acids by themselves need a cell. You know, you need the ribosomes to make the amino acids. And then you need the ribosomes, or no, you, for DNA to be made, you need the ribosomes. And ribosomes do not get made without the whole complexity of the cell, I believe, and so on. Yeah. So e even if you grant, you know, this experiment applies to the, you know, early atmosphere of the Earth, it just, it's, it's still a non sequitur concerning a. You know. Yeah, these these are not these are not self-replicating proteins. So, you know, just amino acids. Even Richard Dawkins admits that. Yeah. Well, um, this is why I love the fine-tuning argument because you avoid the whole young Earth creationism versus uh, atheism or uh, evolution debate. Yeah. So here's his uh, reconstruction of the. Kalam cosmological argument. The Big Bang proved the universe had beginning. Everything that begins to exist as a cause. Therefore, the universe began to exist. And, uh, Therefore, the universe had a cause, which was God. Kalam cosmological argument. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the implication is, uh, you know, this cause would be God. But, um, he, he states that modern cosmology implies that the universe began in total chaos and so possesses no memory of a creation or creator. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what that means. It, it, it's more of a why would God create it in this way, and even then, that's not true with fine-tuning, because the, um, this is an argument I give for the cause having to be personal and intelligent agent, because yeah. the expansion rate, I believe, after the Big Bang and the low set entropy level were fine-tuned as well. Yes. So it wasn't really chaos, it was orderly put in place and so on and then uh quantum mechanics you know quantum vacuums even though that's just the fallacy of equivocation you know well no you're, you're you're getting ahead of yourself you're getting ahead of yourself here because because oh, oh okay okay yes no what you're referring to the his last uh uh sentence here quantum mechanics demonstrates that not everything begins ha that not everything that begins has a cause and yes uh the virtual particles, which he's referring to, which all atheists refer to, it's it's just part of their kind of boilerplate spiel. Uh, virtual particles arise from the quantum foam and from a pre-existent uh, set of natural laws. They do not emerge from nothing. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is it not a sea of energy? 
basically. Yes, yes that is what the what the quantum foam, what the quantum vacuum is, and they they have a a a a they these virtual particles also have a a formal cause, meaning that they they have a determinate form, meaning that they are particles with with a determined spin and a determined charge. And so these are not elephants or bicycles popping into existence uncaused. Yeah. They are they are, are are subatomic particles with a determined form. So again, it does not it does not at all uh, uh, violate. Uh, I mean, disprove the uh, the first premise of of the Kalama cosmological argument. Also, before this, he he says he has a little doozy here. A number of models fully worked out mathematically, show that no laws of physics were necessarily broken to produce the universe. Okay, he seems to be, again, uh, mischaracterizing uh, the Kalam argument here, uh, which is not that, which is not a, a scientific claim. It's a metaphysical claim that everything that begins to exist has a cause. So uh, uh, the person who's advancing the Kalam is not necessarily saying that the, uh, that the creation of the universe violated natural laws. In fact, I think that's nonsense since there were no natural laws yeah, yeah. Uh, outside of the universe itself. It, it's it's like by one meme that I think you liked on my Instagram page where uh, I have the philosopher raptor and basically you're going to try and explain the origin of nature with more nature. Sounds like circular reasoning to me. Yes, exactly, exactly. So uh, his next... Uh, you know, the universe began with a singularity that marked the beginning of time. He tries to quote Stephen Hawking, but of course he doesn't actually give a quote, and we can give the quote. I believe it's on page 138. I'm probably wrong, but basically uh, everyone now believes that time itself had a beginning. Yeah. Well, he said, okay, he says, a, a singularity is an infinitesimal point in space with infinite energy density. Quantum mechanics shows that such singularities do not occur in nature. Now, I actually confessed uh, uh, to uh, JMD Apologetics before this began that I'd like this sounds wrong to me, but I don't have the expertise to say that it's wrong. But uh, I, I mean, I, so I'm not really going to touch that one. But as, as you already said, I mean, it's pretty much settled that the universe is past finite, and that's what the what the Kalam argument requires, not that the universe began with a singularity, but rather just that the that the universe is past finite. Yeah, but it also seems like to me that when it, when it began to exist, it could have came into a singularity starting nature, because I would agree that, you know, such singularities might not exist in nature, even though I do not have the qualifications to refute said point, but it, it still seems like with nature beginning, it could have came into, you know, time, space, and matter. All starting yeah. at one point. Well, yeah. Then, then he says, modern cosmology now has strong reason to think that our universe is just one of an endless number of universes called the multiverse. The multiverse is infinite and eternal. It had no beginning and will have no end. There was no need for a creator because there was no creation. Okay, again, <clears throat> he has a, a non sequitur here. Uh, uh, even if we grant the existence of the multiverse... It does not follow that the multiverse is infinite and eternal and that it had no beginning. In fact, that's part of the standard William Lane Craig uh, presentation is, is the, is the uh, uh, what's it, the uh, Guth Vilenkin, uh, what's that? Uh, Guth Vilenkin board. Yeah, yeah. Model. Yeah, which and, shows. Uh, again, neither of us are, 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 are cosmologists here, but, yeah. but it seems to be, it seems to be the, the consensus that uh, the universe and or multiverse are, are both past finite. There's really no no model that could sustain a past infinite universe or no viable model. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, Sean Carroll will propose it theoretically, but but none of those really hold up. Yeah. And he makes a very bold claim that the universe is infinite. First off, it's multiverse, not infinite verse. Yeah. Theory. And. But what, when I uh, do objections to the fine-tuning argument, I'm going to point out, yeah, there could be multiple universes, but you can't know how many there are. There could just be two universes that could yeah, exactly. explain, you know. Uh, he, he, he tries to say that the multiverse predicts certain things, 
with um you know how prediction is in the scientific method it, it helps the detectable it, it helps something with the cosmic microwave background and so on um oh which which goes into the next point we cannot detect universes beyond our own therefore they are not science and he points out things in the that would exist in the universe you can correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure quirks and black holes would exist in our universe yeah so it's still a non sequitur because he can't go beyond things that are in our universe if he's going to try it and point out things in our universe that we cannot fully detect and so on. If you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, a person, a person might claim that like, and anything that uh, in the black hole that that's beyond the event horizon is, is <laughs> in our universe, but completely unobservable. So. Yeah. I, 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 I accept. I would say it's, it's a self-contained universe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I accept the premise that there are definitely things in our universe that we cannot observe right now and so on. Like, there are still uh, apparently stars reaching, um, oh, apparently there's still starlight reaching from other stars. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, then, and then he says something here, again, he seems very confused in a, in a lot of this. Uh, uh, we could, you know, since multiple universes are strongly suggested by modern cosmology, they must be considered when we debate theological questions. As long as they are not ruled out, they cannot be used as a God of the gaps argument for the necessity of a creator. What? Yeah. What? Or other universes are in principle detectable by their effects on cosmology. <laughs> I, I really, he seems to be very confused. I don't know what he's saying there. But yeah. again, I mean, other universes are in principle detectable. Okay, well, that's that's that would be an inference. It would not be it would not be proof. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, inference are the best. Yeah, best and so on. So it would be evidence, but not well, proof. yeah. But even then, you'd be at the very outer edge of of of, of uh, speculative uh, cosmology. So I mean, yeah, yeah. Um. So the next one, did you say you also do not know enough about to comment on? Basically. Oh well, no. Uh, this one, uh, I, I mean, this was a big point for for Lawrence Krauss. And let me just read this. Okay, okay. so he gives the uh, Christian uh, uh, kind of version here. Where did the mass and energy of the universe come from? And he replies, the total mass energy of the universe is zero, with the positive energy of matter exactly balanced out, exactly balanced by the negative energy of gravity. Okay, now as I said, this was. Uh, a big part of of the Lawrence Krauss book, and uh, that is speculative. It it is it is not uh, it is not based on scientific observation. It it is just simply the result of a certain theoretic model that that there is a zero net energy of the entire universe. So uh, that's not necessarily true. It's speculative. But even if it were true, it would be of no consequence to the uh, Kalam cosmological argument. Because, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I mean, our, in the Kalam cosmological argument says that you know, if something begins to exist. It's not saying anything about the sum total of, of energy in the universe. Uh, it's talking about like anything at all, maybe an imbalance of energy or just protons or electrons or entropic states or whatever. Now, if you're going. Uh, to I, I if you go oh, to I'm reading it. That negates oh, okay. the Islam cosmological argument. Uh, it's like, well, are you going to say that electrons don't exist? That that in these entropic states don't exist? So it's nonsense. I think I don't think he's trying to refute the first premise. I think he's trying to refute the causes of God because he states here, um, our universe came from an earlier universe by quantum tunneling, which I think is the point of this. Which I do not know enough about to refute, but I don't think it's accepted among most cosmologists and so on. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> this proves that it could have come from a prior state of zero energy without violating any laws of physics. Again, he's kind of flailing against the straw man here because I don't know of any Christian who claims that the creation of the universe violates the laws of physics. What, what, what a Christian apologist might argue is that, is that a past infinite universe violates the laws of physics by violating the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah. But I'm not sure of any Christian who claims that the creation of the universe 
violated the laws of physics, which are part and parcel of the universe anyway, because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I, I probably don't understand zero energy, but from my understanding, if you're saying there's no energy, then it seems like we would agree with that, that we agree that there's a, be a beginning where there is no energy at all, basically. Yeah, well, it, it sums out to zero, which is like saying because uh, – because you know the a, a company uh, uh, spends as much money as it makes, therefore money doesn't exist. I, I I think yeah, I think this was in a Peter Atkins debate with William Lane Craig where he says we are nothing because this equals down to zero. Yeah, and then he points out Descartes. I'm at least a thinking thing because oh, I think I doubt, therefore I exist. You know who is there to be deceived? It, it's it's pathetic ways of trying to weasel out of of the most uh, uh, of of the Kalam argument, and and it really speaks very badly for atheists that they they would try to refute the Kalam by saying, "Well, nothing exists, so therefore, therefore, you can't say that something began to exist." Well, it, they they have to exist for that statement to make any sense. So yeah. I uh, uh, Stenger seems to be very confused through a whole lot of this. Honestly, how many years has he been like an anti-theist? Because there's no way if he if he's been doing this stuff for over decades, and there's no way that he can't understand these simple arguments. Like again, I don't know. I think he just he just came up with with the he'd been doing his he'd been a cosmologist for a while, but just kind of. So that there was maybe some money to be made with the new atheist movement, so so try to have a seat at the uh, table of the four horsemen. Perhaps. Again, I don't know, but it doesn't matter now because, according to him, he doesn't exist. But I don't know where he's at. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't exist then, but he really doesn't exist now. But yes. Yeah. So, uh, how can something come from nothing? Yeah, atheists claim that the universe just popped into existence. I can't believe this. It's preposterous. And so he replies, just because you can't believe it doesn't mean it could not have happened. A number of that, That's like me saying, oh, just because you don't believe in God or just because. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think here of what I was going to say. Just because uh, you well, can't no. prove that God doesn't exist, therefore he does exist. It seems like that. He himself in the next paragraph, Stenger himself says, also, are you are you implying it is preposterous to believe that the universe popped into existence from nothing by an act of God. Now that is preposterous. So, I mean, I mean, basically we have, we have one uh, argument against argument of incredulity against another. Well, it, even though I don't, I, I agree with ex nihilo, meaning, you know, nothing. It, it's not in the philosophical sense of nothing because obviously God is something. The universe would come from God since he speaks into existence yeah. and so on. So again, he equiv he equivocates nothing. I, I think a better question is how could an immaterial god cause a material universe and so on, which is a harder question I deal with. Yeah. Um, but again, at least we have a starting point, unlike the atheist. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Going back here, he says a number of plausible scenarios for the natural origin of the universe have been published by reputable cosmologists in reputable scientific journals. Okay, that is a lie. Okay, what they what they describe is a universe emerging uh, 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 from a pre-existing set of natural laws, which would be something, which would be already a universe. Or you could throw in like M brains or whatever in there, but there's some things. They don't describe how a universe could arise from nothing. Which is what the Kalam addresses. Well, um, we sort of skipped over how can something come from nothing, and he he says basically here that nothing really can't exist, which contradicts his um, <laughs> yeah his, his claim that nothing does exist. So yes, oh what a mess this is! What a mess! It's an incoherent question. How can something come from nothing unless you define nothing as an empty vacuum, which <laughs> Is not nothing. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he asks for an example or to find nothing. I use the example. I had nothing for lunch. There's nothing yeah. present at lunch. Well, it's, it's a null set. Yes. Yeah. In any case, the multiverse didn't have to come from anything. It always was. I, again, uh, I think many scientists would disagree with you there. Yeah. So we should uh, move on to the. Okay. Where'd the laws of physics come from? Um, 
he 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 doesn't really answer the question. This I get from. Yeah, uh, I I hear this objection from atheists a lot, and and the atheists. This is the funny thing about atheists is that the atheists will proclaim their commitment to science, but uh, when when trying to argue against Christian arguments, they will throw every single uh, a supposition of science under the bus. Uh, to to vindicate atheism. Now, now I'm sure you've heard uh, atheists argue against the existence of of laws of physics, but uh, I have not heard that actually. Okay, well, what they say is what well, the argument is that I'm losing my voice here. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to get some more water soon. But what they argue is that the the laws of physics are descriptive rather than prescriptive. That okay. these are just the way objects behave in the universe, and the laws of physics just describe that. But it's essentially a, a distinction without a difference, because what those descriptions would be describing would be laws of physics. So, so have, having the laws of physics be descriptive rather than prescriptive is a distinction without a difference, because because you're not you're not making a claim about something actually being different in the world. Well, it, it, it's sort of like the law of identity. I think he's just describing the same thing, just two different ways. Yeah. Now, now, as as Christians, obviously, we believe that the laws of the universe can be suspended for for uh, uh, some sort of uh, you know extraordinary providential act. So I, 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 mean, I don't define miracles as suspension of the laws. I define okay, them as God's. Yeah, I've, I've disagreed with some people about this, but but yeah, I mean, I mean. It, you, I, can, you can you you can uh, uh, at least grant that it is possible for for those laws to be suspended. No, I think they're just changed. Okay, I, okay. I think God just works, um, a, in a different way. I guess is how how I would put it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I may just be describing the. Well, uh, no, I realized when, when I had my hangout with Wayne Fillmore and we were kind of talking past each other for a while, I realized that we, we were operating from two different suppositions because he, he's a he's a Christian naturalist, too. So, I mean, I mean, but that, that's that's fine. Just as long as you as as you grant that it is po that it is logically possible for for the laws of physics to be suspended. Oh, no, I, I I'm, I'm not so much saying that they're not suspended. I'm just simply saying. That uh, God works in a different way than a natural law, I guess. Yeah, it, it, it's probably just the same thing, but you know, because uh, what concerning the Moses uh, plugs of Moses, you know, some tried to explain naturally that uh, yeah, that or, the, or the parting of the Red Sea or something like that. Well, not not the the ten plagues, not the departing of the Red Sea. I, I've seen I've seen you know natural explanations apparently. There's enough wind pressure on the water that somehow split it for you know enough time for entire people to walk across. But yeah, I kind of I kind of uh, can go either way on stuff like that. I'm not I'm not really a big fan of the natural explanations of miracles. Yeah. But yeah, I, I could see the ten plagues possibly being naturally explained, but how they're set up is unnatural. Yeah, ba basically, um, I'm sure you're aware that in Egypt that red algae basically turn the water into blood, but then the flies and so on, and the frogs would come and eat the algae, and that's where all that comes from. The okay, I, that's, I don't know about that stuff, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's very interesting. But okay. um, I don't see how it would follow that, you know, the uh, the darkness on Egypt and then the hail storms and so on. So I, I don't think those could... I, I, I think there are natural laws being ordered in this way naturally speaking in a sequ sequential way but yeah so so victor stenger here is a scientist even though he's not really committed to the idea of of laws of physics even though he tries to describe everything through laws of physics he says of course they must have something to do with reality to agree with observation but we have no way of knowing exactly what that something is so we so we waste our so we waste our time arguing about it Okay, so he's not re he's not really Victor Stenger is is a cosmologist who isn't so hot on this idea of uh, of laws of physics. So yeah. let's not argue about the existence of laws of physics. Okay. 
So uh, let's okay. Yeah, now, now he gets into the fine tuning of the constants. So I'm going to yeah. go get some water here, and so I'll be back. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll introduce. I'll get into it. So if the constants of physics were just slightly different, life would have been impossible. The pro the probability that this happened by accident is infinitely sim sim uh, smelly small. Therefore, they had to be fine tuned by God. So that's obviously not the fine tuning argument. The fine tuning argument is uh, the fine tuning of the universe is either due to physical necessity, chance, or design. It's not due to physical necessity or chance. It's due to design. So there's a straw man of the argument. So, uh, okay. So he, he, he claims here that in computer simulations, that there have been other possible worlds in which we evolved to different constants and so on. But my response to that is there were different, uh, concerning the Earth, there were different planets. You would think that uh, we would evolve or, you know, abiogenesis would happen on those planets if that is true and so on. Yeah, I, I've never heard anything about this number of independent computer simulations. Uh, I've never heard anything like that. Uh, all, uh, what I have heard is that if, if you change uh, something like the cosmological constant by a, a factor of like, of 10 to the, to the 120th power, uh, the universe uh, either either explodes in, just instantly into total entropy or immediately clap, collapses back in on itself. And there are about, uh, I think, 14 different constants that are uh, finely tuned to unimaginable degrees. And I think I've said before, it's like 10 to the 120th power is like the number of particles in the universe squared times the number of seconds since the Big Bang. It's just an unimaginably huge number. And that's only one of the constants. Like I said, there are like 14 different constants. So, uh, oh, there's uh, like 30 some. Yeah, yeah. Well, then there's the fine tuning of the solar system. Then there's the, the fine tuning of, of like, you know, when water freezes, that's a big thing. Water behaves differently than, than most other, uh, than most other compounds. And, and because it does, that is what permits life to exist. So, I, I mean, the, you can pile all these things on top of each other. But as far as, far as the constants, I mean, yeah, these, uh, these are, are, are finely tuned. And uh, I've never heard anything about a wide, a wide range. But yes, if they were slightly off, uh, you would not have a universe where there could be any sort of life at all, except for like Boltzmann brains or something. You know, well, so something hallucinating a uh, a uh, uh, universe or something because it would either be totally entropic or it would immediately collapse back in on itself within a very narrow range of values. Yeah, if gravity was stronger, basically, then only microorganisms could um, exist. We cannot exist, basically, because we'll be crushed. Yeah, and, and then the weak force and strong force, the the four fundamental laws of nature are fine tuned like incomprehensibly and so on. Um yeah, basically he just states here that the probability of an all powerful, all knowing, absolutely good supreme being e existing is more improbable, which he doesn't actually give numbers. But again, it's not an argument for um an all knowing or well actually it probably would be for uh, a very high intellect. But I won't argue for a good supreme being or necessarily all powerful and so on yeah it's he, he's going he's going off the rails here for i, I, I want to touch on, on on this thing further events with infinitesimally low probability happen every day given all the accidents that led to your ancestors what is the probability you would have, would have existed uh i think what he's trying to say here is that like what I, the uh argument that uh, atheists make a lot is that like uh, a, a certain winning lotto number has a very low probability of winning, but yet it happens every time the lotto is drawn, which is a bad argument. But uh, it's like if, if 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 somehow that is predetermined, and and the the winning lotto number ends up being the number that would that was preselected or something, then that would be an astoundingly improbable uh, event. Or you would think there's still fix in it, which is what exactly what the what the people who put forward the fine tuning argument think is that yes, they have been fixed by by an intelligence. That's what would not would naturally 
uh, be the be the inference. But yeah, uh, it's not the fact that any random universe uh, has emerged from these constants. It's that a universe that just so happens to uh, be finely tuned to support life or not to collapse back in on itself or explode into tro total entropy has been produced by these constants. So well, then, then they're, you know, uh, proposed the multiverse, but the four fundamental laws would have to be fine tuned for the multiverse to even create other universes. And then, you know, they, there are you all, they're crabbing different universes. And then they prove our point that the multiverse is too speculative and so on. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Okay, so to judge the one of you, but what is the probability that there exists an all powerful, all knowing, all absolutely all good? You kind of read this universe. A child dies from leukemia. He gets the he gets the argument from emotion in there. Listens to every human thought. Lets a child die in agony from leukemia every four hours in the United States. Okay, what is the what is that probability, Victor Stenger? I, I don't know. You seem to be saying something here. Uh, you tell us what is the probability because we can, we could. The people who put forward uh, uh, the fine-tuning argument actually have numbers. They they yeah. can actually prove their point. Uh, you're making a kind of off-the-wall argument here that seems to have no empirical da data whatsoever. Well, I, I watched um, a hangout that uh, Red Pill Religion did, Max did, um, and he had a holy Kool-Aid on there, and basically he made the same argument of all this all-good and all-powerful, all-knowing being is most likely improbable to exist over the, you know, the fine tuning and the fine tuning argument is not arguing for this type of being. It's arguing for design Yeah, and chance and physical necessity are not likely. So you go with design. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't want to cut. You oh off. no. Okay, go ahead. No, uh, I was going to say uh Stenger makes a, uh, uh, what seems to be a, an enormous concession here. In fact, an all-powerful, all-knowing, absolutely good God is logically inconsistent with all the pain and suffering in the world. This is the best reason for all non-belief. So he's putting he's putting the argument from evil as the best argument for atheism. Uh, so, Stenger, why should we believe that that uh, an absolutely good God is logically inconsistent with all the pain and suffering in the world? Can you prove that? Can you prove that these are logically exclu exclusive uh, uh, concepts? Well, again, I think it's just irrelevant to this argument. But uh, yeah. of course, is uh now on um, the next thing is um. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. He's all over the place here. Yeah, his his, ne his next claim of the theist is God gave human free will, humans free will, so he cannot control suffering, and then he goes into um natural suffering, basically. And that I, I agree that free will ultimately cannot explain every natural suffering event, but there is nothing technically morally wrong with a natural disaster. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, yeah, it's it's bad, but it doesn't it doesn't uh, logically disprove the existence of a, of an omnibenevolent god. Well, um, uh, also a lot of the time it's uh, I people are probably not going to like what I'm going to say, but a lot of the time it's probably punishment for how I grew with total depra uh, radical depravity. I think we are pretty bad, even as a uh, every human being. I think is ultimately yeah better than better than some people, but ultimately we are not good. Yeah, so not, I, not, I think I think you put out that that little uh, meme graphic on Instagram. I like a point there. That's not a, a feel good uh, feel good inspirational quote. <laughs> we are radically depraved. <laughs> well, I agree with radical depravity because it allows free will. You know, we have the moral law written yeah. upon our hearts. Total depravity is where you, everyone is a mal and stall and pull pot. But then the Calvinist yeah. literally goes and said. Because of God's common grace, this doesn't happen. But then we're not totally deprived, so they mm. it, it's self defeating. But that's uh, again irrelevant to uh, you know his claim here. I think. Now, d do you want to start kind of like skating through here because I don't want to get into objective morality particularly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I haven't studied enough on the moral argument, so he gets into the youth of road dilemma. But yeah, he. Basically, he he straw mans. Uh, I'm going to leave a link to this article. Again, again my, my objection would be that there there is no uh lo there is no reason to assume that that a, a a a all good God 
must necessarily uh, uh, erase evil and suffering in the world. Now, it, it could be an emotional argument that, yeah, why wouldn't an all-powerful, all-loving you know, all loving God do everything he can to prevent suffering and evil? But that's not a logical argument. It's, it's an emotional argument. Yeah. Well, um, the claim is that an all-good God is logically contradictory and incompatible with evil. But if God has morally sufficient reasons for allowing evil for the better good, then ultimately he is all good and he allows yeah. evil to exist. An all good God, I think, would allow evil since by definition he allows free will, which is the ultimate good. Yeah. Uh, of course, the atheist is going to be like, oh, if we have free will, then why are we sent to hell and so on? First off, no one's sent to hell. You know, it's separation from God and so on. But I, I do, I, I will... I do agree with Stenger here when he says that's the best argument for atheism. Yeah. If you're going to, if you're going to mount a defense of atheism on anything, I think it would be the argument from evil. Well, if you prove the universe was eternal, then that would be a pretty big theistic defeater. I think uh, of classical theism. Now, polytheism is obviously still an option, but again, I find it a creator or creators contradictory with you know a universe being eternal but we know the universe is not eternal i uh, you're you're way off there but we're, we're not gonna get into that <laughs> sorry sorry but you're wrong i'm sorry <laughs> i am now because like if, if you look at, at at the uh at the aquinas's five ways none of them none of them assume a a a, a past finite universe all of the all of them can be used for for a universe that has always existed. So I, I mean that that's not that's not a crisis for for theism. Well, it is for the Bible at least because what's the first verse? Oh yes. Well, no, that's that's what that's what I'm saying. Uh, is that, uh, yeah, that, that's why I meant for classical monotheism and so or, on. Yeah, for Christian theism, yeah, it might it might be problematic. Although uh, some people even claimed that that Genesis. Uh, uh, describes God bringing forth the, the the universe from chaos. So e even well, that, 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 that that that's first three, and the first verse is in the beginning. Yeah, uh, okay. Heavens and the earth. That's reading things into the text and so on. That's gap theory, I think. But yes, uh, he gets into uh, uh, let's uh, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot. What about all the millions of people murdered by atheists? Hitler, Stalin, now Pol Pot. Well, that's not really an argument, but I will say as when I mention this, uh, much like much like when I mention uh, scientists who are Christian, it is always in response to an allegation made by atheists. Yeah, it's, yeah. That's something I would say unbidden. It's something I would only say if I'm prompted by a claim by atheists. Now, if, if an atheist claims that uh, you know science is incompatible with religion and all all uh, all scientists are atheists, I would respond, "Well, these scientists are Christians." It's not an argument I would make otherwise. And if if an atheist similarly says uh, religion is the cause for all the world's wars, that's all the cause for all the most of the world's suffering or whatnot, it's entirely fair to point out. That that atheists have been responsible for a disproportionate. Hello. Point out Stalin and Mao and Pol Pot, who not only executed millions of people, but they uh, executed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, motivated by their own anti-theistic beliefs. They slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Christians. Uh, for the crime of being a Christian, so you can't you you can't claim a uh, uh, that the that the world must be a better place if everyone were were an atheist because we have uh, significant data points showing that's not the case, and you can't necessarily claim either that that uh, their their kind of atheist biases were were somehow irrelevant to their crimes because in many cases their their crimes were you know, directly motivated by their anti-theism. Yeah, I, I think we should just move on because this is something that I, I think has been debunked like several times. Like, uh, it, now at least he admits that, you know, they did it in the name of atheism and so on. And then he just points out, you know, 
Muslims and Hindus killing millions, which is irrelevant to Christianity. Yeah. It should also be mentioned that that uh, Christians and Muslims and Hindus taken together account for like 90% of the world's population. So uh, so uh, if, if there were crimes committed somewhere in history, it's not, it's not a huge surprise if some of them happen to be Christians and Muslims and Hindus. But for their very slight uh, proportion of the population, atheists have been responsible for a disproportionate amount of human atrocities. So um, there's still a lot here. I think we should do the history and uh, Pascal's wager because a, a lot of these are, you know, just like all religious experiences and so on. Yeah. Which, again, I this are not arguments I use because obviously religious experience itself is an argument for is to convince a person for themselves, but not necessarily for others yeah. and so on. So um, his uh, one oh, there is convincing evidence. The, he, he puts forward the, the Christian argument. There is convincing evidence that Jesus was a historical figure who performed the miracles and rose from the dead. Yes, in fact, in point of fact, there is convincing evidence. And he responds, <laughs> I love this. He convinced there is, there is absolutely no evidence that the Jesus of the Gospels even existed. He is only mentioned in the New Testament, which was written long after his death by people who did not know him. Oh my God! This is so bad. Did you uh have you watched Steven Crowder before? The what? Do you know who Steven Crowder is? Yes, yes, yes. I I don't know if you saw his one podcast, but basically, uh, when he um asks Alexa questions, yeah, um, they basically uh you know who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and it it goes a uh, fictional character. So he basically did a podcast, you know. And Gerald Morgan, Morgan Gerald, I think his name is, he he has a Christian apologist on his podcast, and he basically goes through and debunks this claim. But I posted a comment that got like over 100 likes, and I gave the evidence for, um, you know, Bar Urban agreeing and making a book, tearing this whole claim to shreds, and I point out Josephus, Testus. Yes. And the fact that Jews who, you know, were Jews, basically... Yeah, Jews yeah. Pagans who were, who were completely hostile to Christianity... Uh, no, none of them, uh, the, the Jews and, and pagans of the time, nothing would have made them happier than to see Christianity snuffed out. And, and there would have been no easier way to snuff out Christianity than by proving that Jesus didn't exist. But no one had even dared to suggest that Jesus didn't exist until, until the 1800s. Yeah. And, um, my, my my point was going to be that first Middle Eastern Jews be, became all of a sudden they're going to make up a new religion and their motivation is to get up, get beaten, killed, and tortured. Yes, and yes. The the oh well, that's there are several Jesus myth myth mythicist uh, theories, but yeah, one of them was uh, I forget his name, but yeah, it was invented by the Roman Empire. Yeah, uh, but then they persecuted the Christians the people who follow the religion name, but that doesn't make any sense at all. But Jesus mythicists don't seem to make much sense in general. Yeah. And, um, Bar Ehrman obviously completely disagrees. Now he, he of course attacks the reliability of the new Testament. And when you actually go into, you know, the historical standards of other documents, the new Testament documents have very good historical yeah. reliability and so on. Can I just mention that Bart Ehrman actually has an article on this website on Huffington post uh, that he he published around the time of his book, Did Jesus Exist? And it lays out a little uh, synopsis of the book and just describes it. But yes, you can find on Huffington Post an article uh, by Bart Ehrman called Did Jesus Exist? And uh, it is very useful to have when you are debating with, with atheists on the internet to be able to copy and paste uh, uh, from this Bart Ehrman article. So like I said, that's on Huffington Post, same as this uh, uh, garbage article. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, let's uh, Jesus. Uh, this is what Victor Stenger says here. Jesus is only only mentioned in the New Testament, which was written long after his death. That's false. Okay, the, the letters of Paul were were composed yeah. uh, a generation after it. The uh, uh, two two years. First Corinthians fifteen three through eight is dated two years after. No, I actually think you're thinking of, of the creedal formulations that Jesus died for our sins and, and yeah. was raised on the third day. Yeah, those those definitely do have origins 
within within two years of the cross. But well, the, Herman, uh, the Herman uh, admits that too, which is interesting. Yeah, the the uh, the uh, uh, epistles are, are, are like 15, 20 years, I think. Yeah. And, uh, so he says, written by people who do not know him. That's how how are you going to say that? How do you know that the people who wrote the gospel do not know Jesus Christ? At the very least, he goes on to say, Saint Paul says little that suggests a historical Jesus. He also did not know Jesus. <laughs> Well, no, but he he knew people who knew Jesus, which was the more important thing. Well, Paul Paul claimed to have you know yeah the road Jesus to Damascus, on Damascus Road, yeah. and it wasn't who's hallucination is not a good explanation because he wasn't he didn't want to see Jesus and whatnot. He didn't delude himself into yeah. seeing Jesus. He he hated this idea of Christ and so on. So of course he's not going to hallucinate something like that. I think at least. Okay, then, then, then uh, yeah, he goes into uh, uh, he goes into uh, Tacitus here, and he actually gets into that in the next thing. But the fact that Jesus is not mentioned by any of the many Roman historians of the time, <laughs> okay, it's like, uh, yeah, he was mentioned by Tacitus, uh, uh, very close to Jesus' time. And if you're going to complain that Tacitus was not an exact contemporary of Jesus, that's not a complaint because historians of the time were almost never exact contemporaries of the people they wrote about. Well, th that's the point. They're historians, not eyewitness accounts. You ask yeah. for historical evidence, we're going to point to them. The gospel accounts are the eyewitness accounts. Yeah. Cold, cold Case Christianity makes the case for uh, why they're reliable eyewitness accounts and so on from his school case detective work. I, I, and and uh, there's a uh, I wish I could remember the guy's name, but yeah, uh, uh, Luke the Evangelist is essentially a, a very good historian. Oh I, yeah, yeah, Luke. The way he describes events, or, or he describes events as a historian, and you know he's a very educated man. So I mean, I mean, you can't you can't cast doubt on it. But again, atheists are basically willing to throw everything we know about ancient history uh, under the bus just so they can get rid of Jesus. Because they will call into question the uh, the uh, you know historiographical methods of, of Josephus and Tacitus, and say, "Oh, well, these are not reliable historians." Well, Te Te Tecton TV has a video debunking you know this Josephus claim. Yeah. Now, Tecton TV is a great channel. Yes. Yeah. Now, I do admit that, of course, there are um, forgeries of the original not the of the original but forgeries of church fathers who you know have distorted what he said but we have the closest manuscripts to um i think it's antiquities of something yeah. we have we have a uh, manuscripts before we find the manuscripts of um you know the apparent uh forgeries of them and so on so we can actually confirm what josephus actually reported and so on yeah then he doesn't he doesn't he, yeah, he doesn't try to refute Tacitus. He he just makes a claim that they're historians, not eyewitnesses. Well, it's like duh. Yes, yeah, yeah. But but you know they were good with their sources, which is why their words carry weight. And when you think about it, probably a lot, there were probably a lot more historians who wrote about it. We just probably don't have their documents now because, of course, you have the burning of Jerusalem. Which yeah, right. And plus, some of these documents probably weren't as important as certain historical documents, so they might have, um, you know, uh, the, obviously the paper goes away after a while, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, well, the, the earliest scribes did not use the uh, highest quality parchment. It was only it was only around the the, the second century that they started using uh, uh, better quality uh, uh, materials. So any the stuff that was written, uh, in the first century was pretty much lost. So um, the next claim, there is just as much evidence for the existence of Jesus as for Socrates. I have this as a false claim. I said there is more evidence for Jesus than Socrates and so on. Yeah. Because the manuscripts are much closer to the originals than, of Socrates. So on historical grounds, I believe you can actually possibly make a case that Socrates might have not existed and so on. From a certain because um we we don't have because we have the twenty four thousand manuscripts and i don't know how many manus manuscripts we have for socrates but it's nowhere as close yeah the the iliad is the closest 
to you know the New Testament. It, it only has a thousand manuscripts. No, I mean, I mean that's the thing. He talks about like Plato, Plato as as an eyewitness to Socrates. But yes, uh, uh, we do not have uh, the, the source documents. The earliest documents we have of Plato is way after Plato lived, centuries and centuries. We don't have the the intermediate uh, 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 documents. So it seems it seems kind of odd that he's using that to to build up the uh, the historicity of Socrates, and while 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 complaining about the the scarcity of evidence for Jesus. At the end of the day, it's just a miracle biased. However, you want to define miracle, but it's, it's just a bias against the supernatural and a presupposition. Exactly. exactly. Now, maybe you know more about this than I do, but isn't uh one of the gospels uh, dated past uh, seventy A.D. Just because they could not accept uh, Jesus's claim about the the fall of the third temple. Well, actually, it's the complete opposite when you think about it. Because as you mentioned before, Luke. Well, again, that's uh, that's on the presupposition that the God, that the eyewitness uh, testimony. They're trying to make up a conspiracy, so they since they knew about the temple, therefore they made it seem like Jesus predicted the temple. But that just adds in more things you have to prove and so on. Yeah. Well, uh, again, with Luke. He writing as a historian, you would think that he would mark something as you know before the fall of Jerusalem and so on, before it was burned and so on. He doesn't. Even, and yeah. This is why Acts is reported as um or earlier than the fall of Jerusalem because you would think that would be mentioned in church history because it's a pretty important event and so on because Christians were killed and so on. Yeah, and the first martyr obviously was Stephen before the fall of Jerusalem. But Luke, this is an argument in cold case Christianity, basically, that Luke, you would think that Luke would have written about this. And uh, also with the polls of Bathsheba, I believe, or Bethsheba, um, we we found those, of course, in the ground because they were destroyed by the Romans, of course. And that and Luke and many of the other Gospels, I'm pretty sure, talks about these polls and so on. Mm. And uh, we find them. And if they were written after the fact then those will have not been reported because obviously these polls that they're talking about were not there after the fall of Jerusalem and so on. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's there's better evidence that they were written before uh, 70 AD, if not earlier. Yeah. And Luke actually uh, copies the Apostles' Creed that I talked about before, I'm pretty sure. It's either in Acts or the beginning of Luke, I think. Or somewhat met, implicitly mentions it, I believe. Um, and that could date it even closer. But yeah, yeah. Uh, the the yeah, the creedal the creedal formulas that that were that were basically you know agreed upon uh, just two years after 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 the crucifixion. Yeah. Um, I think we should just skip. You know, Jesus. Yeah, a lot of this isn't very interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, by, I, the way, I, by the way, the uh, the whole thing about the uh, earliest creedal formulations that comes from Bart Ehrman himself. Yeah, yeah, we hear that from Bart Ehrman, him, Ehrman himself. So even a skeptic, even an, an agnostic skeptic, says Jesus definitely existed, and, and the earliest the earliest uh, 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 writings about him, the earliest creedal formulas about him, were 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 basically conceived two years after the crucifixion. Yeah. Um, so I think the last one we should like cover, or actually two more, and then, you know, we can end it, is, um, Pascal's wager and evidence of absence is not, you know, or, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, because he, he makes an argument from ignorance in his response to that, and goes with the lack of belief and equivocates atheism. Okay, so I'll just read this, and you can you can add your comments. So he, he characterizes the Christian. There is every reason to believe in God, and no good reason not to. If you do, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose, and that's Pascal's wager. Yeah. Now I would agree with him. I we went over Pascal's wager today in one of my classes, uh, modern philosophy. I I don't think it's a good argument because it's mainly a presuppositional argument yeah. because he is a reformed thinker. And he's arguing that we cannot know because we are tainted, uh, epistemologically speaking, which I do not agree with reformers on. We cannot know anything without knowledge of God, ultimately, which I think is very self-defeating because how would you come to that statement? But, um, and so it's arguing that 
since we can't know, since the advantage of, you know, God, believing in God is, uh, you, you, you either win it all, you you lose nothing. So you should, you know, believe in yeah. God. But then I agree with, you know, people like Matt Delahanty where they point out what about other religions and so on. And then you have different definitions of God. So me personally, I don't think it's a good argument. I used well, to use no, it. But I think it's also important to notice that, that this was not the basis of Pascal's faith. Yeah. Pascal had powerful mystic experiences throughout his life. So yeah. it was not, he was not, he was not making a blind claim that, Oh, we should believe in God because it makes us happy. And, that was not his is is uh that was not his claim. Uh he was just saying just kind of pointing out the fact that yes, I mean I mean you do you do basically lose nothing uh if you believe in God and then die. And, and his point I, uh, a lot of atheists who attack and say, well, we have to make these sacrifices uh, uh and, and live for the expectation of eternal reward. But I think Pascal very much believed that belief in God makes our makes our our earth earthly lives richer, not not that not that it, it's it's uh not that it's painful in our earthly lives. He's it's, it's something you want to believe in your earthly life. Well, he I'm pretty sure he was a Calvinist, so you can't even choose to believe in God or not to. So that's irresistible grace, which I do not agree with. Well, he was a Jainist or something. I think yeah, I, I'm not an expert on that, but yeah. It, it, in um, the earlier chapters of the Ponces, which is where pa Pascal's wager is, and he, he, he basically talks like a Calvinist, basically, and we can't know anything because we're uh, to to the total depravity would wipe out any sort of epistemology we have and so on. Yeah. The Ponces is kind of like Ecclesiastes. It's kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a, kind of a, a, a very uh, a kind of a, a not not the most optimistic text, but yeah. All is vanity. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's go with um, you know, where he tries to show that because we can't know if God exists beyond a reason doubt, okay. therefore he does not exist. Here's a, here's him characterizing the Christian argument. Just because there is no evidence for God, that does not mean that he does not exist. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Okay, first off, we as Christians reject the premise. <laughs> we reject the premise that there is no evidence for God. Yeah. Now he should say, even if there were no evidence of God, that doesn't mean that does not mean he does not exist, which would be more fair. Now, of course, me and you would agree that there's plenty of evidence for the existence of God. Yeah. I don't think there's proof which would be absolute certainty. And I'm not saying, oh, then then where's room for faith? Well, it, it depends on how you define God, but yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't, me personally, I, only on presuppositions you can have absolute certainty, but that's why it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Because um, I love J. Warner Wallace, you know, cold case detective. He goes into this, anything's possible, but is it reasonable to believe and so on? Yeah. And he, he goes into the cases and so on, how some attorneys have put forth these absurd ideas that are pos possible of how, you know, the client kind of got blamed for this. But the overwhelming evidence points towards the fact that you are guilty. Yeah. Right now, innocent, of course. I, I mean, it, it's very strange to me. Okay, this is what Stenger says. Absence of evidence is evidence of absence when it is evidence that should be there and it is not. Okay, I agree with that. If the God most people worship existed, we should have seen some evidence for him by now. I, 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 I really don't know of any Christians who would agree with the claim that there is no evidence for God and that no one has ever seen evidence for God. So he's arguing against the straw man of all straw mans here. I mean, is it when, when Jesus... When Jesus resurrected from the dead, was that not uh, uh, evidence to his followers? I, I, I think when he's very Thomas ran his fingers in the wounds. Was that not evidence? I mean, now, sure. I mean, I mean, uh, Stenger may not believe in the historicity of Jesus, which, of course, is not a valid view at all. But you cannot complain. You cannot say that that Christians don't believe in the value of evidence when evidence 
uh, is part of the Christian story of, of the doubting Thomas who only believed when he was able to, to put his finger in the wounds. Yeah. Um, I only see how you answer this, though, but bless are those who have not seen and yet believe. Is that not your rational faith or blind faith? No, I, I, I mean, I think, I think he's using C in the, in the most literal sense. Well, see, well, when you look into the text, it's just taking one verse out of context. Because first off, Jesus appeared and rose from the dead. That's proof to me. Yeah. And then literally the verse right after that, the next section is, these eyewitness accounts were written down so that you would believe. <laughs> so Yeah. Problem solved. Yeah. Um... I, I think the point of his first paragraph is his argument trying to show that because there is no evidence of God, therefore he does not exist, which of course is a non sequitur and argument from ignorance and so on. Yeah, the more one studies, this is Stenger here, the more one studies religion objectively, the less likely, the less one is likely to be religious. Okay, why? Why should we believe that? Studies studies show that atheists know more about religion than theists. Could very well be the case, but the those those uh, uh those little questionnaires they have are really pathetic. It's like yeah. Uh, that then he quotes three people to you know try and prove his point. Let me see. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Jay Warner Wallace, who was an atheist for thirty five years, yeah, who basically had everything down the same view. Uh, Anthony Flew. Of yes. course, he didn't become a Christian, but he was a big anti-theist, but then became a, a theist himself. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Alistair McGrath. Yeah, 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 him too. Yes, Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean, it happens all the time. And yes, these were atheists who said, who spouted many of the same talking points that modern atheists do, that, yeah, belief in God is so is so ridiculous how can anyone possibly believe it but guess what they came around what oh was that a rhetorical question yeah no yeah exactly exactly okay bart Ehrman, dan barker and john yeah, yeah. and then of course way, is yeah again as you said here uh uh he cites uh bart Ehrman as an authority in this last paragraph when Bart Ehrman wrote an entire book debunking the Jesus mythicist uh, 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 entire entire claim that that Stenger advocates earlier in this article, yeah. It, again, this article overall, I I just had to do a response video yeah. to it because I just found it to be a very uh, it is astounding. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, there's so many humdingers here. Many clergy persons are coming out of the closet now, no longer able to maintain their self-respect, preaching the nonsense they have been taught to preach their congregants. We are beginning to near the point where we can imagine no religion. When that happens, the world will be a better place. It's like he's just he's just flinging this just rhetoric out there. It's like, D dude. Prove yeah. anything you're saying, but we should also note there's not a single citation given in this entire article. Yeah, yeah. and uh, well, no that's that, that's paper. typically of every you know CNN article or Huffington Post article and whatnot. But um, uh, again, he makes he makes that claim, but then he that you know without religion, the world would be a better place. But he admitted to the millions killed because of atheism before. Yeah. There, 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 there are significant empirical reasons to believe that is not the case. Yeah. The fact, now, the fact that the <laughs> that the 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 secular regimes of the 20th century have been have been more you know have murdered more people than just about anything else is is a is a significant data point that atheism does not necessarily make everything a, a, a all hunky dory. Yeah. Um. It. it it also seems like to me that he, he just talks in circles in this article, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I was really not prepared for how bad this article was. And we, we skipped over a lot of this. But, but I was expecting something to be there. But I, 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 as, I, as, I said to, as I said to you before the hangout began, it just, it just seems like a little pissed off 13-year-old Reddit kitty wrote this. 
not 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 uh not an 80 year old cosmologist and he, he yeah. was up there in age he was up there in age it, it, uh, honestly if he's been doing this his entire life you'll think he'll know the arguments better unless he is actually just suppressing evidence on purpose and straw manning on purpose and so on unless yeah. he actually doesn't understand the arguments but of course he would understand the cosmological argument and so on because he's a cosmologist and he yeah. straw mans all that too the only thing I'm not really certain about is when he claims that that uh, uh, quantum mechanics has proved that singularities don't exist, and that seems like a very suspect claim to me. Although I don't have the I don't have the authority to say it's it's wrong. Yeah, like quoting from the same book though that I gave before, unless unless somehow my quote state because I, I admit I haven't read a brief time in history, but yeah, again, if my quote is taken out of context and someone please correct me, but I don't think it is. I think Hawking well, that, that's, that's what, that's what we're saying is that it's of no consequence to the Kalam argument in any case. Yeah. Because the, the Kalam doesn't, doesn't necessitate that the, that the universe begin with a singularity. It just necessitates that the universe uh, begin at a finite point in the past. Yeah. Um, what well, I remember what I wanted to say uh, before were me and concerning, you know, would you know the world would be better if you know if it was just atheism and so on now if it was just a modern day atheist then um perhaps not but uh, again if it's like the stone like atheist and obviously and again that's the purpose of my is atheism worldview at least as subjectivity if we somehow live in a subjective world where you know no one wants to kill you because you're religious and technically that would be an atheistic world and it would not be i can't eat in an atheist atheistic world i cannot use the term bad or wrong but it, it at least wouldn't really imply much suffering while it islam says specifically in sort of not to kill the polytheist like i said earlier yeah that is a strict ideology which if it did rule the world and christians would not be able to exist on atheism if you do not hold the stalin view that uh, government is god and so on and we should get rid of religious thought then uh you can the like, christians can't exist in a world but of course, you know, if there was no religion, that would be a contradictory statement. I, I get that. But of course, if atheism was the main view, especially just the lack of belief in atheism, because obviously most hold to that view. <laughs> Never consistently, though. Never consistently. Yeah. And that's the thing is that atheists frame the debate in terms of atheism versus religion, which is the wrong way to frame the debate. Because uh, first off, the, the opposite of atheism is theism. Which which can yeah. take many different forms, and uh, uh, we are not apologists of religion in all its forms. Uh, well, Satan, I, I'm not going to defend Islam anytime soon. But. Yeah, uh, we're not defending Islam. Uh, Satanism is a religion. Uh, we are not defending that either. Uh, which is so, made it's, up of uh, atheism or a, a lot of well, yeah, a lot of them do identify as atheists. But it's not fair to expect us to come to defense of all religion because we're not defending all religion. Yeah, but Hinduism. When, when someone makes a ridiculous claim that religion is the source of all the world's wars, yeah, we're going to attack that because it's simply not true. Yeah, especially the American Revolution, uh, American Civil War. Yeah, it's World War One, World War Two, and so on. You can list war after war that is not. Oh, true. you want your seven percent? I think I think the uh, history of war uh, anthology it determined that only seven percent of the world's wars. Well, we're religious in origin, so there you go. I, I agree that ideology start most wars, but it's not significantly re specific religious ideologies and so on. And so, but you'd never hear anyone say, "Boy, wouldn't the world be better without ideology? Wouldn't the world be better?" That that, that, be that would be an ideology right there, though. <laughs> yes, yes, we have to kill all people with ideologies. <laughs> yes, so I, I think we've we've spent enough time on this. It's a yeah. bad article. Yeah. It, <laughs> I was really not prepared for how bad it was. Yeah. Well, you don't really have to prepare it that much to debunk it. I didn't really have to think about much of it. <laughs> no. But again, it, it, uh, now if this is why we also need apologetics, because if a normal Christian comes across this, they're not going to be able to answer like half the three fourths of the stuff in here and, the purpose of this article is to attack people like that who don't know yes. anything about apologetics and so on. 
because obviously they won't know the arguments and they won't realize that these are straw man arguments. And that's why I want to do a video like this to warn people, hey, if you don't study apologetics, then these crappy arguments will probably leave you for, lead you away from your faith and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I have a higher opinion of myself than to say that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's why I have so much respect for guys like Frank Turek. I mean, if you're a teenager and you see a presentation – it's 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 simple. I mean, it's 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 laid out very simply. But even just seeing a Frank Turek uh, a presentation should be able to inoculate you against ninety five percent of these dumb atheist arguments. Now, it's still possible that the atheists will have a little something that you may not know how to respond to. But I, I mean, I mean, most of them are are are, are wrong in such a trivial, apparent way that they're, they're really no problem. You know. Well, typically speaking, when they present something that you can't really fully um, counter, it's normally something that's speculative and that us as human beings cannot know. They appeal to things that we overall cannot have absolute, well, yeah. ed, things that we have to remain agnostic on, they appeal to things like that. Yeah. But um, I think Frank Turk would agree with me concerning the need for apologetics and so so on. Definitely, definitely. And this and this needs to be a part of every basically every every large church in America is, is having apologetics for, for youth groups. E even if there were no atheists or agnostics or people attacking us intellectually, Christians still have doubts and they still need apologetics. And plus we're called to love the uh love yeah. our God with all our mind and so on. Yes. I'm reading J.P. Moreland's book right now, Love the Lord Your God with All Your Mind. And uh, the first chapter was just showing the need for apologetics in the history of. But basically, up until the you know 18th and 19th centuries, when fundamentalism like young earth creationism and the rapture and so on started coming about, is when apologetics, intellectually speaking, has really died down. And I think that's why we're suffering the consequences nowadays and so on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is your view on the rapture, real quick, or have you not formed a? I I, on that? I, don't, I have not really uh, uh, formed an opinion on it. Although I will say, as as a Catholic and as someone who was raised Catholic, <laughs> no, no one said anything about the rapture. Okay, um, yeah, you you probably don't. Do you know much of the views of Revelation and so on? Well, like the the millennialist and the and the yeah, yeah dispensationalism. You probably never heard of idealism. I'm a, like a modified idealist, and so on. Oh, is that something applying to Revelation? I mean, I know what I. Yeah, do. basically, oh, you take yeah. all the you you take in context of Jewish apocalyptic literature, and what the New Testament says, and so on. You apply it to Revelation. You just don't read Revelation by itself. You take it in context of the whole Bible, yes. and you realize a lot of the symbols represent certain things in Hebrew and Greek language. And basically, it's rep, rep, uh, repetition of um, symbols describing the same thing, just you know, like yes. the seven bowls, seven trumpets, and so on. Describing well, it, the same. It's a chiasmus, I think, is what they call it when 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 revelation is basically a mirror image of of, of basically the creation of the world. That, that's not my view, but um, basically, from my view is that I don't take. The you know all the twenty one punishments the like the futurist does that these are twenty one sequential events that happen like you know the left behind books I don't take that view at all yeah I think from the time of um the millennium which is Christ's uh one thousand year reign I take the view that from John's revelation up till then the sim symbolism describes that period between uh those two events and so on yeah which is my view. But, you know, I could be wrong, of course, because there's, like, uh, no theology is objective. <laughs> mm, mm. That, that's why I think uh, there's Arminius, Calvinists, and Molinists, and so on. We can't agree, and so on. Now, yeah. I, I think we all objectively agree that God exists, and so on, and that Jesus rose from, from the dead, and so on, but... Yeah. Um, now, I think Arminius... Arminianism versus Calvinism is a bigger subject because that also attacks free will, and free will is pretty big in salvation. So, on. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, there there are certainly uh, liberal Christians throughout the throughout the twentieth century who who, who do not hold for for a literal uh, uh, resurrection or something. But those, thankfully, have gotten less less prevalent as time has gone on. Yeah. I, I think I think that when 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 Christianity uh, uh, tries to make concessions to 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 naturalism by kind of by modifying its supernatural claims, it becomes much weaker. It does not become stronger. Well, some some Christians are materialists, and it sort of scares me. You ask them a question: How can God exist since He's an immaterial being? And they special plead for Him, basically. Yeah, well, well, that's that's Christian naturalism, and uh, there are several different forms of that. But but yes, my my main objection to it is that it's just not necessary. So it's, I, it's I, not biblical either. Yeah. I, now uh, again, we have to define what we mean by immaterial. Yeah. Well, now, if something uh, immaterial by definitions would have the Aristotelian feature of substance. I think mm -hmm. it is something. In its essence, it's not nothing, of course. Yes. Now, I, I'm i not an expert on you. When we say God's timeless, spaceless, and immaterial, I, I, I don't take it as too literal as, you know, God does not exist anywhere and he never existed at time and so on. I, I think it just means beyond our views of time, matter, and space. Yeah, well, if, depending on if you're like a TMM, they all think, well, I'm not even going to get into that. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think I think <laughs> I think we should wrap it up here. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, yes, uh, I enjoyed doing this. It was a, it was a horrible article, but it, thank you for bringing it to my attention because I now realize just how bad Victor Stenger really was. And he's yes. very he's very highly esteemed by many atheists. But holy crap, is is he full of hot air? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So thanks for coming on. No problem. And, uh, man. Even though most of my subscribers are subscribers to you, I will just say this. I subscribe to Deflating Atheism. I left a link in the description. Yes, and to everyone on my channel, subscribe to the JMD Apologetics 101. Yep. Great channel you have. Yep, and uh, like, share, and subscribe this video and so on. Now, are you, were you going to upload it to your channel? Yes, 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 yes. Because obviously it will get more views because I'm catching up to you. I have like 101 subscribers, but you're gaining like hundreds yeah. now I, I had a nice little boost i had a nice little boost uh two weeks ago so yeah that's that's appreciated but yeah you're invited to come on. i'm gonna have a little uh 2500 subscriber special so you could come on and cool uh, when, when are you doing that well uh, i think so, i think the sunday sunday okay yeah. and we'll we'll have a we'll have a grand old time you're you have to watch my 100 subscriber special because uh inspiring philosophy is going to excellent yeah yeah which is cool I never, I've never, I've never had any interaction with him at all. Well, there's something I have on you then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yes, I think, I think uh, I will bid you a good night. Yep. And and God bless everyone. Yep. Okay.